Welcome to episode 178 of Sports Geek. On this week's episode, I chat with Wayne Swass about mental health and his new business, Pucker Up. Welcome to Sports Geek, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host, who looks forward to meeting all listeners in real life, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan, and I do look forward to, and I love meeting all listeners in real life. I've recorded this before I've headed away, but currently I am in Europe, um, and so if you're in Europe at the moment, uh, I'm be heading to Amsterdam soon, and then Copenhagen. If you're listening to this in early January, uh, please reach out. Uh, I love catching up with listeners, and hopefully uh, by the time this actually gets published, I've already done so in Paris. So... Uh, welcome to 2018 for the first episode of Sports Geek. I hope you enjoyed the Sports Geek replay series uh, that filled your podcast feed. Um, some great episodes there. If you have not listened, I suggest you go back. They are some of the best episodes of 2017. What I wanted to do is I re- uh, wanted to kick off 2018 with a, a great discussion with a good friend of mine uh, that I caught up with uh, prior to Christmas. Uh, Wayne Swass runs a A new business enterprise, uh, Pucker Up, looking to help solve mental health and normalise the conversation around mental health and and help prevent uh, suicide overall, uh, as it's a a massive problem. And uh, uh, Wayne talks about it. For those who don't know Wayne, and we do briefly talk about it, Uh, Wayne is a former AFL uh, footballer uh, that has, uh, you know, become... You know, very public and a very public advocate of mental health and and sharing his story and what it why it drives him and that's pretty much been the was the discussion that that we had. So um, I hope you ho- hope you de- genuinely in, enjoy this. Uh, what we try to what I definitely tried to do from an interview point of view, make it a authentic and genuine conversation, which is something that drives Wayne. Um, here is my conversation with uh, Wayne Swass from Pucker Up. Very happy to be here in uh, what is maybe sunny Melbourne, but it's been rainy the last couple of days uh, at the offices of Pucker Up. I'm here with the CEO and founder, Wayne Swass. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, it's good to be on here, Sean. Good to see you again. It is. It is. Um, so first of all, just for introduction for people who don't know, don't know you, don't know of you, um, can you please, uh, I guess, give us a bit of background of what Pucker Up is mm-hmm. and where the genesis of it came from for you? Yeah, pucker up. A pucker is a Hindi word, and it actually means authentic and genuine. They're two of the. That's a definition of, of the word, and um, it's significant on a personal level, but it's significant with regards to what it is that we try to do on a daily basis. And authentic and genuine were two traits that I was not during a twelve and a half year journey with mental health conditions. So it's a daily reminder that I need to be authentic and genuine in order to maintain good health, both uh, physically but more importantly mentally, and it's also. Uh, the mantra of what we're trying to encourage other people to do or empowering them to be more authentic and more genuine when it comes to their own mental health and emotional well-being because there's a tremendous amount of people that are living with mental health conditions right around the world but specifically here in Australia that are living with these conditions privately, secretly and I and we fundamentally believe that they don't have to do that. The genesis for this organisation, it's an interesting interesting um, journey because I've done the charity thing before with uh, my old chairman who is now the chairman of Pucker Up. Yep. I've worked in the space of mental health for 12 years. So we ran the Sunrise Foundation for uh, six years um, and we decided to close the doors down in 2010. The reason for that was that, um, and this is respectfully though, the philanthropy, the philanthropy money is quite onerous or restrictive. Yep. And we were delivering four programs to secondary schools here in Melbourne. Those programs had a research piece to it. Those programs had a screening tool in it. And those programs re- required parental consent. And that we were one of the first organisations to deliver a program um, with all of those components in it. Uh, But we ran into an issue and that was my chairman uh, back in 2010 challenged me, how do we go from four programs to 40? And the problem was we couldn't because philanthropy money at the time didn't allow us to grow capacity. So in theory, 
more programs, more people. Yep. We could deliver the programs, but we couldn't employ more people within our business to help us facilitate and execute that. So it became a scale issue. It became a it was it was the probably the biggest single barrier that we couldn't overcome. So we decided to close that organization down. Um, and I've continued to work in this space for 12 years as a mental health advocate, public speaker, all of those type of things. And unbeknownst to me, my old chairman, who's a very dear friend and mentor and a great, a great mate of mine, uh, had been watching me uh, closely and quietly with regards to a conscious decision I made midway through last year, and that was to really ramp up my social, my, my uh, advocacy work, specifically via social media. Yep. And so that's when you were you were doing Facebook lives everything. and just and you were just pulling everything. out the the camera in the yep. park. Yep, everything. And just doing that stream of consciousness. This is what's on my mind. Well, it's it's a bit about this is what's on my mind, but I, I'm a firm believer. If if I'm going to preach it, yep. and I'm going to try and educate people about all of the things that I think are really important, I have to live it. Yep. And if I don't live it, well, I'm a hypocrite. So I had spent the previous twelve months working out at the age of forty seven, going forty eight. What's my purpose? What do I really want to do? A lot of people would say, well, you're an AFL football player. That's a chapter written so long ago. It used to define me. Yep. It doesn't define me anymore. And um, through the course of last year, I came to the realisation that my purpose in life is to use my experience and my journey with mental health to help other people. I started to really embrace that, which led to my amplifying of all of the content that I was producing on social media because it gives us more access to more people in more places in a much in a fraction of the time. Yep. And and a lot of the things that I, I uh, do and share is about my own journey, my fears, my worries, my mistakes and everything because I need to be authentic and genuine with my messaging because if I'm not, how can I sit there and expect to try and encourage other people to do the same? And uh, my chair, my old chairman um, rang me in February of this year and said, I want to catch up for a coffee. During this period, I've been thinking to myself, I've got a high-paid six-figure salary with, with Telstra in sales. I've been really successful in that, but it wasn't nourishing my soul. Yep. I've been trying to work out how do I exit out of that, supplement that income, and then move into what I'm really passionate about. And at the same time, the planets align. My old chairman, who's very successful in business, rang me, let's have a coffee. He sat down and uh, to summarise the the, the uh, conversation, it was along the lines of, I believe in your vision. I believe in you. I want to give you that opportunity. And uh, about five weeks later, uh, we sat down and we agreed that um, was, this is going to happen. And uh, we created Pucker Up and we're uh, eight months into our journey and it's very exciting because outside of my family, I wake up every single day excited about the opportunity of helping one person. Reality is we're helping a lot of people and a lot of people we don't know. So we're about creating safe, supportive, non-judgmental environments that em- that empower and allow people to have authentic and genuine conversations about mental health and emotional well-being. At the pointy end, what are we really trying to address? Yep. We're trying to address this issue of suicide because it affects nearly two and a half times the number of people compared to our national road toll. It's a significant uh, issue. It affects enormous amounts of people, communities and the country at large and we're going to give it our best shot. So, I mean, yeah. That's I did, a long-winded answer, it, it right? It is a long-winded answer but it, it does, I mean, straight away you can see the, the, the passion uh, in your voice and what you're saying and the fact that, you know, you made that leap and it was tough, like, you know, the whole, hey, I've got to leave to go into, you know, startup land effectively and, and start this and then... But, but you were just – you just sort of felt this pull. Mm. It was just like, no, I've got to do this. This is a scratch that I've just got to uh, uh, tackle. So now you're in that spot eight months in. How, how do you try to get that focus? Because, you know, you see the problem is this big and you can be pulled in multiple directions. Mm. What has been your focus <laughs> in the first eight months? <laughs> That's – I mean, that question is – is um, is it really – it's an interesting one because I'm, I'm easily distracted. I um, am very good at there's the goal, I'm single focused, I'm, I can go very, very narrow on what I need to do and if anything gets in my way then I'm, I'm, I've got to keep going until I execute the goal. That's my strength. Uh, time management's not one of my strengths but fortunately for me I've got a board member who has been an incredibly successful uh, businessman in his own right 
um, successfully managed and run um, uh, large um, ASX listed companies. Yep. He sent me down recently and said, you've got to get better at this. So uh, the listeners can't see it, but that's Wayne's world. So every yep. morning I come in here and I have 30 minutes, no phone, no connection. Uh, Nikki, our office manager, takes all of my gadgets and after sitting in here with a blank board and after have to think about the business, what I want to do, what's the priority and those type of things. So it's a process. I've got my skill set, but I've also got weaknesses. So in order to make sure that I'm complementing my weaknesses while enhancing my strengths, I'm very lucky that I've got a diverse team that are supporting me. My chairman reminds me all the time, um, uh, um, the, the uh, how do you eat an elephant? It's one yep, bite, at, one a bite time, at a time, right? Yep. So I want to conquer the world and I'm impatient, mm-hmm. but I've got to do it step by step. And each step that we take has to come back to our vision. Does this help us? Is this moving? It? Does it get us a step closer to ultimately achieving our vision? If it does, then we invest into it, our time, money, effort, whatever it may be. If it doesn't, then we don't. So it's a learning process. I know what I want to achieve, but I can't achieve it on my own. And I'm prepared to accept the fact that I've got, I've got weaknesses and failings and sometimes when the ego gets in the way, you yeah, perhaps don't want to acknowledge that or accept it, but I think I'm getting much better at accepting the fact that these are my strengths, but which of my team members can add to my strengths so that together we can achieve our ultimate goal. Yep. So you, you briefly brushed over it because of uh – you know, you're saying it's a former chapter in your career, but, you know, long-time AFL footballer, uh, champion at uh, both uh, North Melbourne and the Swans. It's a big part of your story, both as a, as a footballer and being in this world of sport, but then also your mental health story is so entwined with that. Mm. How do you, like, how much of Pucker Up is seeing what's happening in the world of sport and, and you know, leveraging the experience you do have, you know, that's where your strength lies. Yeah, th- look, there's a lot in that question, Sean, and, and, and I don't want to be dismissive or mm. disrespectful, but there was a long time where I thought my identity and my self-worth was all wrapped up in what I achieved as a sports person. Um, and I think that's a challenge that all sports people, especially at the elite level, male and female, will go through is who am I off the sporting field? Yeah. And because you're involved in this industry which or industries which are tr- tremendous opportunities and great experiences but it is constant you don't really get an opportunity to understand or reflect on who am I outside of what I do on the sporting field and I went th- through that for years and I'm proud and I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for the opportunities that I got but it, it's a chapter that was written 15 years ago it doesn't define who I am yep I'm thankful and humble when people want to recognise or acknowledge what I was able to achieve as a sports person. But really, I guess what sport and my career has given me is a vehicle and a platform. So I want to I want to be respectful of that opportunity and those experiences yep. because they were great. But the work that I do now is so much more important because it's not about me. Yep. It's about what I can do and what our organisation can do for other people. Sport... Media, my experiences have given me a opportunity which not everybody gets, and that is the vehicle and the, and the platforms to be able to leverage this conversation so much higher and so much louder. So, um, I, I, I say I, I might sound dismissive, but I'm not. Yeah. But I'm so focused on the work that we do now. This playing footy is great, but it's not life saving. It doesn't change people's lives. It gives them. Uh, two and a half hours of joy or disappointment depending on the results. To some people, it might be life and death. That's the way it feels, but for me it's not. The work that we do now um, is so much more rewarding and so much more important because the reality is that the work we are doing can and does have a positive impact on people's lives or at the very pointy end saves them. And yep. I can't think of anything else that I'd rather do. So I guess I guess the angle I was going, and I completely understand your question, is the fact that you know sport is sport is a great connector of people, mm. and you know one of your missions is to normalise the discussion around mental health, yeah. 
and we've seen a big change in the way that uh, sportsmen that have put their hand up. You know, I spoke to Blake Soli and uh, around GI, and uh, you know, Alex Vasolo, and those kind of stories have come out in the last eighteen months that have generated positive discussions as opposed to you know even five or six years ago it was a different discussion. Mm-hmm. So, how do you as an organisation, you know? leverage those conversations seems the wrong way to put it, but amplify and really, I guess, make that a positive conversation for people. Well, I think how we do that is that when, when I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think if you had it said to me at the beginning of this year that we would have three players within the AFL industry who are all high profile, who are really, really well paid, in, in fact they earn a ridiculous amount of money compared to the rest of the general population, if you had have said to me that within a five-week block we would have had Alex Vasolo, Tom Boyd, Travis Cloak all come out publicly declare that they were living with mental health conditions, I would have said if we can reach that watermark in my lifetime, great. Yeah. We've done that. Couple that with Greg Inglis, who I think is one of the greats of NRL. Absolutely. Checked himself in to a facility because he recognised he needed help. I've interviewed him on our own pod, uh, podcast, Brennan Favola, Caitlin Thwaites, Libby Trickett, Osher Ginsberg, a host of people that have gone through their own mental health journeys and challenges. They're really powerful because if you, if you think about metaphorically, we stand on the edge of a pond and we throw one rock. That little rock will ripple. Every time there's a ripple, there's an opportunity for that ripple to touch somebody else. Yeah. So when we have those high-profile people talking about these type of issues, it gives hope and a bit of inspiration to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the broader community that are working out whether or not they can or they want to reach out and ask for help. And what do we do to um, amplify that? We celebrate and, and applaud it because we need to recognise and respect the courage of the individual elite athletes and high-profile people and make sure that they are fully supported because if we can do that, then we're also offering our, our support uh, to so many people in the broader community. It's, yeah, it's, an, it's, all, it's in other, all other industries. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate at all. It's got nothing all. to do with your material wealth, got nothing to do with how successful or how poor or, or or whether you've come from a stable home um, upbringing or a single parent family, it has no difference. And one of the things that we try and consistently do, and, and this was the genesis for series one of our podcast, I wanted to talk to high profile people because I wanted to debunk the myth that if you're well paid, high profile, playing an elite level sport, you've got nothing to be depressed about. That couldn't be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. Oh, com- yeah, completely. And so, you know, when you're in that position uh, of, of low energy, you know, that that can't get out of bed, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to do next, um, you do sort of reach out for whatever resources mm. were there. Mm. And, you know, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they just weren't available. Whereas now, I mean, the internet has brought people a little bit closer and you can reach out and find different people. But the good thing about, you know, the podcast that you're doing, Pucker Up, which is now available, is that, if you're in that state of mind, you can start listening to these people and and start figuring out. Oh well, I'm like them, mm. and you know that's why it's good to have the high profile people, celebrity, the athletes, and go. Well, oh well, I'm, I'm like them. They reached out. Mm. Uh, you know what can I do? Mm. And you, and you point them to all the the different resources to say, you know, this is where you could go. The thing I love about the podcasting, and I'm not sure if you 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 feel the same way, but given the nature of the topic. Mental health and emotional well-being and suicide prevention are topics that aren't discussed openly and honestly all the time. We haven't quite normalised them. I think that we're moving that conversation. Yep. We're moving it at a slower rate than I'd like. Um, But the thing that I love about podcasting is that if somebody or someone is going through a really difficult time, they may not be ready to talk to somebody about it. They may not be ready to disclose anything about their own private situation. Yet with po- a podcasting, it's content on demand. Yeah. So I can download it. And and you might be a good friend of mine or a family, but you, you have no idea if I've downloaded it. You have no mm. idea what I'm listening to. But I could be sitting in the room with you or on a train or in a car with my earphones in listening to a conversation about mental health, emotional well-being or suicide prevention, and it's it, it's a private experience. And I think that gives 
hopefully a lot of people the opportunity without putting any stress or pressure on themselves, I can actually listen to this and hopefully help myself take some skills out of it or lessons that allow me to make some positive changes in my life. And I think podcasting is a really safe environment and platform for people going through difficult experiences to start to listen to other people beginning to normalise these conversations. And it gives you the the breadth and the room to have that conversation. Like, you know, you work in radio and media and you'll have a have a have have an interview and you've got your eight minutes between the sponsor bumps. If you're lucky. If you're, if lucky. You're, if yeah. you're lucky. So yeah. whereas with a podcast, you can, you know, you can go as long or as wide or as off tangent or mm. you can dive into a story. Mm. Um, and because it is, you know, so personal, whether you're, you know, going for a run or walking to work or you're in the train, but you're in your own little world, mm. um, you know, I, I find that as a podcast listener, it's terrific. As a podcaster, it's terrific. What um, one thing I've found as a podcaster is because people are l- listening at all of these times when they're not engaged with other devices, they're really locked in, all right? So then, because they're driving their car or they're running, so yeah. they're not looking at another phone, they're looking at the TV. It really they really get your attention. Hmm. The converse of that is they're not ready to tweet or send an email because they don't have that device. What kind of what kind of feedback are you getting either on social or via the back channels or that kind of thing for the podcast so far? It's a, it's a bit of – well, series one, we finished a 12-part series and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's humbling and quite surreal when you get – Random messages, and I'll I'll mm. share two. I, I, I've got two in the last week, from one from a, a, a husband and a wife who I've never met. Yeah, this is the power of the world we live in now. You just never know who you're touching when you're putting things out. And I got a, a tweet. This this couple shared it uh, last week, and that was they were thanking us for the podcast series and how much it had helped them start to understand and learn about mental health and the issues that people are going through. And they thanked us for it. Yeah. So that came via Twitter and that was shared publicly. So I reshared that because Mm. that, I guess, is um, there's no better validation than someone's invested their time to download your podcast or that episode and then they've invested 45 minutes to an hour of their time listening to it. Then they've gone a step further and said, thank you. Yep. That's, that's that's a really humbling experience. And then on the weekend, I'm a, I'm a crazy, passionate, not very good cyclist, but Brendan Canty, who is one of the up-and-coming cyclists here um, uh, internationally and, and from an Australian point of view, he's on his way back from overseas and he's on Qantas, a Qantas flight and he tweets the, the fact that there's one of our podcasts and he's listening to it. Yep. I, I don't know what else we could possibly be doing, and you're probably in the same position, where you create this content because you believe in the value of it, but that value gets amplified when you've got other people who have invested their time listening to it and then going to the effort of sharing that. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the reason why I do why what I do. And, um, you know, I think as of last week, these numbers aren't huge, but we had 30, about 35,000 downloads over the series. Yep. That may not be a lot of numbers compared to other podcast series. But what I would say to anybody, that is potentially 35,000 conversations around mental health and emotional well-being and suicide prevention. That's oh, powerful. Oh, completely. And that's the thing. I mean, it's it's a bit of the tip of the iceberg. So for, you know, it's a bit of you sort of do the maths. So one person that's tweeting, there's 100 people that are listening. Yeah. Or, or something exactly. along, along those right. lines. Yeah. And yeah. it very much becomes a word of mouth thing, whether you're, you know, whether you're talking to them and goes back to your mission of creating more, you know, com- conversations mm. uh, around it. So. Yeah. Is there, you know, so you've done the uh, you've done the first season. What are the plans uh, for the podcast uh, going forward, or yeah. is there other content pieces that you want to look Already to put out? Already planning series two, and series two is focusing on one of the things uh, I think that is somewhat problematic here in Australia is you can go to a whole host of different websites and places, and what seems to be happening is we're reinforcing what people already know. This is depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia. This is anorexia, um, all postnatal depression. Yep. What seems to be missing in the marketplace is, all right, don't sort of tell me what I already know. Yep. What are the things that I can be doing to help myself? So series two for us is going to be all about 
what things can people do in order to start to turn their mental health and emotional health around? We don't believe that anybody has to get to a crisis. And what I mean by that is if you look at the mental health spectrum and people's mental health and, by extension, the mental health sector, it's heavily skewed to crisis. So if we yep. were – zero is good health, five is the midway point, eight, nine and ten. Eight, nine and ten is crisis. You need to be in crisis before you get it, um, accepted or admitted into certain facilities to get help. That's the real point in. That's yep. when people are in potential danger. Or people are waiting until they get into a crisis with a mental health issue – before they start thinking about asking for help or seeking help. So we don't believe you have to wait to get to a crisis. And there's a disconnection with human beings. We're, we're interesting. We prioritise our physical health because we want to look good, feel good, perform better and live longer. And we agree with all of those things. But we don't approach our mental health in exactly the same way. So part of what we're trying to do is give people the environments where they can have authentic and genuine conversations but help them develop their own toolboxes. So series two will involve things like talking to a GP um, about what, what goes on when you go to a GP and you start to talk about mental health. What's a mental yep. health plan? Yep. Psychologists, psychiatrists, what's the difference? Meditation, mindfulness, sleep, gut health, health, fitness, exercise, yep. all of those things are skills or tools that people can learn all in one go if they want or they can take bite-sized chunks. It's really about giving people as many options as they possibly can so that ultimately they can start to look after their health. Because at the end of the day, whilst I reply, I rely on my network of family and friends, my health, physically and emotionally, is ultimately my responsibility. If I'm not prepared to take responsibility, I can't expect everyone else to do that. Yeah. Yep. And it does become, you know, as – I've done uh, started doing recently. I read a I read a book called The Morning Miracle from by Hal Elrod, and it literally was get up every morning and go through a whole bunch of those things. Um, he goes about uh, uh, silence, a bit of meditation, mm. uh, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and his last one is scribing. Now I've tried my best to hit all of those, right? And that's the thing you get all that you try to hit all of them. I haven't hit all of them, but what I have found over the last six months doing the scribing, so the journaling every day, the morning pages, which a lot of people do, it just gets you gets me out of my head and, and gets me in a positive frame of mind mm. every morning. Mm. Um, but it is something that it's a it's a practice that you just have to get used to. Mm. Is there is there tools that you say I've got to do to check in with yourself? Yeah, they, they, I've got a. I've developed, you know, it's one of the things, if you had said to me during the 12 and a half years I hid my conditions, depression, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, that I would be running a social enterprise which is trying to encourage and empower people to do all the things that I chose not to do. Yep. There's irony in that. Yep. Um, I'm grateful for my journey. I really am. It was tough. It was incredibly challenging and sometimes very painful. But what it's allowed me to do is a few things. One, I'm a better person because of the experiences. As much as I hated them, I'm a much better person. Um, two, I've got an internal checklist. And I was thinking I caught a train in this morning. Train means I don't have to worry about traffic, weather, stress on the road. I can yep. sit there and I can listen to music or I tend to listen to podcasts, Lewis Howes. Has got the school of greatness, unbelievable. Lewis, I, yeah, Lewis is a good mate of mine. Yeah, is he? yeah. Well, I've, I've shared his podcast because yeah. he talks about things that can help me. Yeah, masculinity, vulnerability, taking off your mask. Um, he's got some fantastic episodes. So I would rather use my time in the car, my time on a tram, or my time in, on a train, listening to something if it's not music that could potentially benefit me. Because yep. I'm always, I'm in this endless search of how can I improve myself? And I share those ones that I really, really enjoy. Um, so it, it's, it's the internal checklist allows me to identify stresses in my life which may be causing some anxiety. I haven't been depressed for years, but I've had a couple of um, challenging weeks with anxiety this year. And I can immediately and honestly say to you, sleeping less, exercising less, diet's poor, drinking more, not looking after myself. The moment I address all of those things over a period of a week to two weeks, I'm back. Yep. And 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 I I 
fundamentally believe that alcohol gets in the way of people being productive, efficient, effective and achieving the goals that they want. Hand on heart, it is the single biggest deterrent that gets in the way of people wanting to achieve all the things that they really want to achieve. And it's a bad habit. Yeah, uh, yeah, it definitely, it definitely is. I think the other thing that I've found uh, is the support for your loved ones that aren't going through it mm-hmm. and not knowing mm-hmm. how to deal with the person that's deal, you know, that's trying to deal with it because yep. they they have they don't have any idea. Mm. How, how much is, you know, what you're trying to do both with the podcast and the content and that kind of thing is giving those people some answers. Mm. You're not going to give them the total answer, but it's mm. like, well, these are the things you need to do to support this mm. person. This is what they're looking for. So there's a couple of things that I'd say there. Um, one is, uh, and it's a fantastic question that you ask, but what I'd encourage people to do is put yourself in this situation. Let's say someone that you love Uh, gets diagnosed with cancer or diabetes or asthma or breast cancer, prostate cancer. What we do as human beings is, okay, okay, that's that's challenging and a little bit scary. What do we need to do? How do I support you? So we talk to the doctors, we talk to each other, we engage in conversations, but probably what a fair percentage of us would do is we get online. Hmm. I need to understand what this issue is. So how can I help the person I care about by educating myself? That is fundamentally the number one thing that people should and can do if someone they care about is going through a mental health condition. Educate ourselves. What are the signs and symptoms? How is this particular condition or these conditions impacting this person? Because what that allows you to do is that allows you to be able to support that person more productively and proactively, gives you an appreciation of the impact that these conditions are having on the on the individual. And... Um, I I think it plays a really important supportive role in the person's recovery because if we don't educate ourselves, if we don't get an understanding at a basic level of how this condition is impacting them, then we could play a really negative, destructive role in that person's potential recovery. So I would encourage everybody to educate themselves. Uh, Definitely. Um, What's the – one of the things that I'm always fascinated with uh, around foundations and driving around a mission is – there's a lot of players in the in the market, and there's other foundations that are doing men's health and and other pieces that there's a overlap. How does how do you and how does pucker up like work in that? I guess that 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 market and, mm. and all of those different players. How do you, how do you sort of find your niche, but then also work within a system where you're potentially driving towards the same goal? So number one, we're not a foundation or a charity; we're a commercial enterprise. Yep. So we are looking to approach a social issue from a business perspective. Okay. Yep. Reason for that is quite simple. There's more than six hundred thousand charities in a population of twenty five million, and those numbers grow every day. The funding pool hasn't matched the growth. So in actual fact, there's more charities competing for less money. Unless you're one of the big charities that gets the majority of the funding here in Australia, we don't believe, and I certainly don't believe this, which is supported by my board, that the long-term sustainable future is a sustainable outcome. Yep. Because you cannot, for the majority of foundations, they are reliant on one funding source. That funding source decides to stop funding your organisation or they move their money to another cause you're exposed. Yep. So how can you look into the future beyond the current funding round if you've only got one revenue source? So we are looking to become a self-sustaining business with all of our profits being reinvested without any caveats or restrictions into the areas that we want to. So we're currently looking at some business opportunities that we would consider investing in. Profitable business, that's the outcome. Yep. And if we can achieve that, then we've got additional revenue to begin to invest into other areas that we want to invest into and begin to tackle this issue of suicide and suicide prevention. So that's that's a very um, significant distinction compared to everybody else. Yeah, completely. Else. Yeah. Yeah. But again, having a business view, if we can execute on the plan, then we're confident that our long-term sustainability will, will, um, will be achievable. I mean, there's no point doing what we're doing for four or five years. We want to be doing what we're doing 25 years. And if we can do that, then we're going to have a reasonably big impact on reducing the numbers of people that think that they have to end their life or that's the only choice they've got left. So how do uh, how do people get involved, support, uh, 
Yeah, throw their weight behind, pucker up. Yeah, well, the only thing that I've ever asked for people to this point in time is just join our community. Um, we, we, we're nearing 10,000 people on our Facebook community, um, pucker up, P-U-K-A-U-P. I would just encourage anybody, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're supporting somebody who's going through a difficult time and you want to be part of a community that is supportive, non-judgmental, respect you and accept you, then you're welcome. I I, I really want to encourage anybody, even if you want to learn about mental health and the challenges and it's not affecting you, then this is a great environment for that. We're doing a suicide prevention bike ride next March, Sydney to Melbourne, 1,433 kilometres. Everything I do is on script or there's a very good reason. 1,433 kilometres means that every kilometre ridden will honour two lives lost to suicide last year. So we lost 2,866 people to suicide. We're going to travel 1,433 kilometres. We'll have community forums. We'll have, and, and really the bike ride is a vehicle and platform to create a national conversation around this issue of suicide. We're active on all social media platforms uh, we have our website. It's all the same name. Um, it, uh, we've got our podcast series. We're just trying to touch as many people with as many different things that we're doing. So if people would like to get involved, then we would love to have people involved. That's it. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, one, I guess your openness and authenticity. I mean, very much on brand and you never never swayed. And uh, I, yeah, I really do appreciate the work that you're putting out thank there. Thank uh, Both for... Uh, for the general market, but also I, I do see that ripple effect you're talking about in in the world of sport. Um, I think you are, you know, leading the way in that in that space. And I do think you know there are kids who are watching their their heroes go through those trials and tribulations, and uh, you know it will save lives. So thank you very much for coming to the podcast and love your work. Pleasure to have the opportunity. Well done. Want to start driving more revenue from digital? Go to sportsgeekcampaigns.com. Uh, thanks again to uh, Wayne Swass, or Swatter, as he is known. Um, you can uh, send him a tweet, Wayne Swass, uh, S-H-S-C-H-W-A-S-S, is how you spell Swass. There'll be links uh, in the show notes, and please check out puckerup.com. Um, and, uh, and and see you know if you want to get involved in the initiatives that he's he's doing and sharing what he's doing on social he's doing a great job in uh, sharing the com- having those conversations uh, and normalizing the conversation around mental health um, and uh, the, the the real tough thing is around this conversation and it's something that I sort of briefly touched on in my conversation with Wayne it's it is a tongue twister it's it's tough to tough to talk about it's something that I have uh, had my ups and downs uh, with with depression, both uh, before starting Sports Geek um, in in dealing with uh, dealing with loss uh, and losing my losing my wife to breast cancer, Bunny, um, and then you know just some of the the trials and tribulations of of running your own business uh, in the solo nature that it is, um, and the ups and downs of the roller coaster of running your own business. Um, it can get really tough and it can get really lonely. I'm really thankful for the support that I have and I'm really thankful for the work that uh, people like Wayne Swass are doing uh, to make it okay for people to talk about it, uh, admit it, uh, get seek help. Um, so if you're ever feeling that way, um, please seek help. Um, I know I've done it previously and it's worked immensely. Um, and... You know, and things like, and I did discuss it, uh, uh, the the daily journaling um, of getting the ideas out of out on paper. And sometimes it's all business. It's all, hey, this is what I've got to do, and it becomes a bit of a to do list. But other times, it does come down to, and it's a bit of talking about how I'm feeling, how I'm dealing with things, and it gets it out of your head. And sometimes that's the really good first step, and it's a really good first step for me. Um, and a really, on a really sad note, um, a couple of days after my chat with uh, with Wayne, a um, I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't say his close friend, but a friend of mine, uh, Blair Smith, who is a uh, uh, basketballer. Uh, he played for the Melbourne Tigers and was a member of the 1997 championship team, which uh, I was really close with all of those guys, and uh, I was a big fan and uh, close with that as with that team as a group. Um, unfortunately, he was. Uh, he was declared missing and then um, 
and then found dead uh, a couple of days later after our conversation. And it's it's really sad to, to hear that, uh, you know, here I am doing a podcast and uh, trying to normalise mental health and, and Wayne's doing a terrific job trying to reduce the numbers of suicide and then literally four days later to have someone I know, um, you know, someone that's, you know, a Facebook friend at the at worst, but I and I haven't spoken to Blair in a long while. Um, but to having to commit suicide is really, it's super sad. It's super sad, and the super sad part is also that one that he's taken his life, but then also the fact that uh, his family didn't know and he didn't reach out and he didn't he didn't want to have that conversation. Um, and so, you know, I think what Wayne's doing with Pucker Up. Um, as you said, it's a Hindi word that means authentic and genuine. Um, if you're feeling that way, uh, please uh, have those conversations. Talk to people. Um, yeah, it's yeah, super sad. And so, rest in peace, Blair. Um, so it's a bit of a, a bit of a sad note to start the podcast on and 2018 on. Um, but uh, I didn't. I really couldn't have this podcast and and talk to people like Wayne and try to make influence without. Without putting my hand up uh, myself, and but then also, you know, letting you guys know how how affected I am by by losing someone like Blair. So, for those of you who are uh, friends of mine who are part of the Melbourne Tigers family, um, you know, my my heart goes out to you all, and obviously goes out to Blair's family and his and his wife and his kids. So, yeah. Um, yeah, look out for your friends and uh, maybe reach out to them every now and again. And if there's anyone, you know, that uh, is feeling that position, I won't put my hand up and say I know how to help. Um, but if you reach out to me, I'll, I'll respond. And there's definitely a lot of resources. And if you go to puckerup.com, a lot of resources you can reach out to uh, to seek help. And um, I highly advise it. Um, really hard to segue um, off such a somber and sad topic. Um, but... As this is being published, I am, as I said earlier, um, currently in Europe, um, part holiday, part meetings, uh, part meetups, part interviews. Um, so if you are in uh, Amsterdam uh, this week, I'll be in Amsterdam from Jan 9 to 12 and then Copenhagen from Jan 12 to 17, please reach out. Um, I'd love to meet up, um, hopefully be doing some speaking, uh, some speaking work, maybe a workshop or two, or just catching up with listeners and hopefully catching up with an interview or two. So if there's someone that you think I should be interviewing um, in those cities, please reach out, Sean, at sportsgeekhq.com and, uh, and let me know. Um, I'm happy to, happy to chat to them. And then I guess the other part of the equation is if there's, if there's some work opportunities, um, I'm happy to explore them. Uh, we do a variety of different uh, things at Sports Geek, and one of the things I'm trying to do a little bit more of is actually talk about that so people know that, yes, I'm a podcaster, but uh, I do spend most of my week uh, working with clients, whether it's uh, building chatbots or building out campaigns for sponsors or reviewing content to, to see if there could be new content developed for sponsors and sponsorship opportunities, um, helping evaluate uh, value and value your uh, your assets so you can better monetize them so a whole bunch of things that we do um so if you think you need some help in that space um and it might be just a simple call and i can say yes i can do that or it might be uh, something a little bit bigger uh sean at sportsgeekhq.com is how you get in touch um as always as a listener you can always book in a time for a chat uh, by going to sportsgeekhq.com slash phone call so thank you very much again to wayne swass from pucker up for being guest today um, as always, my name is Sean Callanan, and you've been listening to Sports Geek. Join over 1,000 sports business executives in Sports Biz Slack. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Slack. Please share your fave episodes of Sports Geek on LinkedIn. Be sure to tag Sean Callanan. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources. Want to chat with Sean? Book a time for a call. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash phone call.